Thank you very much for joining us and welcome to the IA Awards 2020 online program. We're so pleased to welcome you to the latest event in our series of online webinars designed to inspire, influence, and share environmental best practice. Today's event will be focused on tackling the problem of waste. Throughout the webinar, you can ask questions by the question and answer tab below, and then they will be answered later in the, in the event. Recordings of all events throughout the week will be shared by e-newsletter to all attendees by Friday. This year marks the 10th anniversary of the IIA Awards, and we decided to launch a full program of free online events for you and your team to join. The aim is to engage organizations with different environmental initiatives to inspire, influence, and share best practice. This program will culminate in the IIA Awards at 4 p.m. on International Clean Air Day, which is Thursday, the 8th of October. This has been a very unsettling year for businesses, communities, and individuals. The health and sustainability of our environment has never been so critical in the climate crisis, and loss of biodiversity has been further exacerbated by the economic health and social challenges created by COVID. The pandemic has markedly changed business practices for the long term, and we hope that there's opportunities to improve business practices in terms of sustainability. We believe that changing workplace practices to incorporate environmental decisions into the very heart of our organizations is vital to, to build resilience and to create strong, sustainable businesses. So by running our events online, we're hoping to really bring people together, share learnings, a bit of inspiration, and be an example of how events can be run sustainably in the future too. If you'd like to attend any other events this week, there's still time to register your place at the IIE website. Today's talks, uh, we'll be hearing from uh, author Jen Gale um, on zero waste-ish tips for slimming your bin for the imperfectly green, really a way to get started and get inspired. Um, she's written a book called The Sustainable-ish Living Guide. Her talk will be followed um, by Chief Executive of Surface Against Sewage, Hugo Tagholm, who will be talking about driving systems change through grassroots activism. Their talks will be followed by a Q&A session, so you get to ask some candid questions from our speakers. And then I'll announce the II winner for best waste reduction category. So I'd love to introduce you to a very exciting person, Jen Gale. She's the author of the Sustainable-ish Living Guide. Um, Jen started her exciting eco-activism after her life changed following a year of buying nothing new, which is a pretty incredible um, effort. That year changed not only what she buys, but also how she sees her place in the world. She recognized the power that we all have as individuals to make a difference to the things that we really care about simply by through our personal and daily choices. In addition to Jen's writing and also strong social media presence, she produces podcasts about all things sustainable-ish. And Jen's the author, as I mentioned, of the Sustainable-ish Living Guide, which is available now and soon to be available, the Sustainable-ish Guide to Green Parenting, which is out in March 2021. Without further ado, I'll hand you over to Jen. Hello, everybody. Hopefully you can hear me. April, tell me if people can't yep, hear me. I can hear um, you fine. And let's see if I can now, I feel really powerful when it says I can control your screen. So I'm just going to see if it is actually working. There we go. Brilliant. Um, so welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to investors um, in the environment for asking me. Just a very, very brief intro, because April's already done one. Um, uh, I, I always say I'm just an ordinary knackered mum of two, um, because I feel like that's a really important point, because I think sometimes when we see um, eco-activists or people doing amazing things, um, we kind of think, oh God, you know, I, th th there's no way I certainly feel you know times I get overwhelmed to think well what can I do how can I make a difference I'm so busy and I'm tired and the kids are being irritating and things but what I strongly believe that we can all make a difference so that's why I make a big point of saying I'm this ordinary knackered mum of two um and as April said we are sort of eco journey started when we spent a year buying nothing new and before that we're talking today about waste and before that I had genuinely never even thought about waste I think that's one of the issues that we have is that we're so lucky here in the in the UK and in the developed world to have a very um, efficient, although we whinge about our recycling and our waste collection systems a lot, it, it, we do have a very efficient waste and recycling system and it's out of sight, out of mind, isn't it? Once it's in the bin, we don't see it anymore. But um, so through this year buying nothing new, um, I've uh, sort of 
several years later now got this amazing online community, 50,000 people all together. And the important thing about the is the ish in sustainable ish. And it's about taking imperfect eco action. Um, lucky enough to have been invited to do a TEDx talk during that year, buying nothing new. And as April said, um, the uh, lucky enough to have a book published um, in January this year, which has been an interesting year for, for books coming out, I think all the sort of events and things that were supposed to be happening. So by the very nature that you're here and um, you're probably well aware of the issues with rubbish, but just um, to put it in context a little bit, there's an amazing, um, really short, it's about 20 minute um, film by the story of stuff and the amazing Annie Leonard. And in there, she, she says this stat, which I kind of had to go back and replay several times to really get my head around it. But according to, to them, just 1% of the total materials used in production and manufacture of goods are still in use six months after the date of sale. 1%, so 99% of that stuff is either sat languishing somewhere not in use or is, you know, has been chucked away. And the fact is that, you know, it's, it's not just about what we're throwing away, it's the resources that we're using to make that stuff, the energy that we're using to make that stuff. And um, I was chatting to someone last night and they said that, you know, I think when we talk about carbon footprints, um, lots of us will think about um, travel and energy. We won't necessarily think about consumption and the things that we're buying. So actually, but it is all really, really connected. Um, and we're running out of resources to make this stuff that we're then using for less than six months and then kind of chucking away. Um, it's this very linear system we've got. Um, so the average person in the UK will throw away their own body weight and rubbish every seven weeks. Now, that's more or less shocking, depending on how much you weight you've gained during lockdown, I guess. Um, landfill sites are also a major emitter of methane, which is a, a greenhouse gas that's about 30 times more potent than, than um, carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas. And I think that when we think about stuff in landfill, we think that it it sort of sits there and it rots down nicely. And then we get this lovely kind of mulchy compost or something at the end of it. And that's really not the case when things are in landfill because of the way that landfill sites are managed, it's, a, it's an anaerobic environment, so there's no oxygen. So rather than sort of rotting and breaking down, things just kind of ferment. And even things that we would think of as uh, really readily biodegradable, like newspapers and things. Um, there was a documentary a couple of years ago on the BBC called The Secret Life of Landfill, and they, um, they were digging up like capped landfills and they found you know newspapers in there from the 1980s and if you're anything like me you'll think the 80s was only you know 10 years ago but it wasn't was it it was like 40 years ago um and uh, you know they were still completely readable there were clothes in there that just needed a wash and they could have been worn um so this was from 40 years in landfill and we're imagining that all these things just um sort of rot away and become these benign substances and sadly they don't and we are um you know at, in the uk we are running out of landfill space and a lot of our rubbish is now going to energy from waste which um has its own set of um sort of complications shall we say so one of the issues one of the issues one of the solutions or part of the solution i feel is is us and um how we think about waste and more importantly actually how we think about things before they become waste so i never in my wildest dreams thought i would be um, a waste hierarchy geek but it turns out I am, and I absolutely love this waste hierarchy. It's an expansion on, if any of you have got kids of a certain age, you, you might have um, had Bob the Builder on in the background, and uh, they talk about um, you know reduce, reuse, recycle. It's probably something we, a lot of us were taught at school, and it's kind of an expansion on that mantra. Um, and the idea is that we start at the bottom and we work our way up. Now, um, whether you're um, watching this webinar and, and you're coming from a, a sort of business perspective or whether you're watching it as an individual thinking about what you can do about your waste at home, the same principles absolutely apply. And also remember that if you are here um, in your capacity as a um, you know, business owner or an employee, we are all individuals as well. So we all have bins at home as well as the fact that we all have bins at the office. Um, so all of these principles are um, able to be um, applied wherever you are really. So we're starting at the bottom and we're looking at refuse. So um, again, I'm probably showing my age, but just say no if anyone gets that reference to Grange Hill. Um, I um, popped into the supermarket yesterday and actually I had to queue outside. So while I was waiting in the queue, um, there they had their Halloween display up and there was like 
plastic hazard tape with pumpkins on it. There was a plastic um, kind of black cascady ribbon thing with, you know, bats and stuff like that. And, and it's great and it looks really exciting and I'm sure the kids would love it, but it's single use plastic. And at the end of the day, do we, do we really need that to make kind of Halloween for one day? And unless you're very diligent and you roll it up really nicely and keep it somewhere safe and remember where it is next year, that's single use plastic and it's just gonna go in the bin. So do we really need a lot of these things that we're, um, that we're told we need by, um, by retailers? Um, so let's, you know, it sounds really dull. It sounds really boring. It probably is a bit dull and a bit boring and we need to pop our sensible grown up pants on for a little bit, but, um, and it can be really easy to get carried away, especially, you know, we've got Christmas coming up and things like that, but let's just take a little breath, take a step back and think, are there some things that we can refuse without our life being particularly um, sadder or poorer? So, um, you know, single use items around, Halloween, around Christmas, around fireworks, around Easter, anything like that, um, any kind of novelty plastic. Um, can we refuse, um, you know, balloons are a really good one. Um, I'm sure Hugo knows, you know, the, the issues that even, even though um, rubber balloons are, you know, biodegradable, animals don't know that when they eat them and things like that. So there are things that we can refuse that won't actually make our lives a huge amount worse. So um, that's the first step to think about. And, and that, if you notice, is the biggest layer of the um, waste hierarchy. I've only got 20 minutes, so this is going to be a bit of a gallop through. Um, so bear with. And if you've got any questions, do pop them into the, the Q&A box. And then the next level up um, that um, waste hierarchy is reduce. And again, you know, we live in this um, time of convenience and consumption and we can get pretty much anything we want, um, mostly pretty cheaply, probably next day if we use Amazon. Um, so the, the concept of reducing is actually probably quite a kind of... Um, a difficult one really um but you know so when we think about things like um fast fashion um can we reduce the amount of um clothes that we're buying can we um a lot of the time we buy especially things like clothes or whatever because we're bored because we're out with family and friends it's a bit different at the moment i get i guess um you know people probably aren't shopping so much as a kind of hobby and a pastime anymore but you know again we really do just need to to take a stop and to think oh that's whipped on i don't think that was me that's magic um so uh, i don't think i can go back let me see beyond it's beyond the remit of my capabilities but we'll just pretend we're still looking at reduce. ah thank you <laughs> thank you magic slide person um reduce so um you know for things like clothes for things like uh, kids toys I mean god who doesn't look around if you've got kids who doesn't look around their house and think where am I going to put any more toys this Christmas um and there are ways that we can do it that don't mean that we miss out or we feel we've got any less there's brilliant um like toy subscription sites you can there's lots of um share shops popping up around the country so lots of ways that we can still have the things that we want to need without necessarily um contributing to the to the volume of resources used and the volume of waste that ends up at the end of it um and when we think about things like food as well about 30% of, um, of all food produced is wasted and 50% of food waste occurs in the home. So is that something we can look to, to reduce? Can we, if, if, you, if you have a look in your bin and take a sort of cold hard look at what's in there, you know, are you one of those, and I think one of the most common things is that people will buy a, a bag of salad every week because we should be eating salad. And then at the end of the week, it's gone a bit slimy and a bit moldy and we put it in the bin and we can buy a bag of salad. And um, so, do you know, are there things like that that you can reduce so that you're not constantly um, just this cycle of kind of shop to bin, shop to bin, which is um, really quite depressing when we start to think about it. Right, let me see if I can now. Okay, so reuse is the next thing up. Um, and uh, there's some some more um, images there that possibly show my age. So um, I love I just love some of these upcycles, really it, clever, inventive things. But you don't have to be this clever or this inventive to reuse things. Please believe me. Can you reuse the um, inner of your cereal packet to wrap your sandwiches in? Can you reuse that same inner of your cereal packet to um, freeze some something in the freezer? Can you reuse? Um, 
all the uh, you know ice cream tubs margarine tubs as um tupperware and things for keeping leftovers in like it doesn't have to be particularly hip or glamorous or exciting or inventive just start to think a little bit um you know bags that we get bread in you can use them for poo bags you don't need to buy a poo bag do you, you know so so can you reuse these things so that even if ultimately they're still ending up um in the bin they've had another life and it's prevented you from having to buy something else specifically to to um to perform that function so again it is just a little bit about thinking outside the box if you do want to get crazily inventive with reuse things like that then pinterest will probably be your friend um so you know there may be some things that you can't recycle or you can't get rid of like floppy disks and things and um, if you're inventive with a glue gun that might be what you want to do for for Christmas presents this year. Um, so Rehome here we're talking about um, charity shops but we're also really importantly not just talking about charity shops. I think the charity shops at the moment are probably absolutely inundated with all our stuff because we've all had a bit of a, um, a um, a clear out during lockdown um, and uh, and the easiest guilt-free way to get rid of those bags of stuff that we've now decided we don't want in our house anymore is to give them to the charity shop. If you wouldn't buy it from the charity shop, don't give it to the charity shop. Um, you know, the, the if something is, you know, is ripped, even if it's just missing a button, they don't have the resources, the time, the volunteers to, to mend that and to put it on sale. So it will just go into um either into the rag bag or um into landfill so all you're doing is kind of giving that that guilt um passing that guilt on to somebody else and i really strongly believe that charity shops shouldn't be kind of our um panacea if you like for continuing to consume at the levels that we are so as alternatives to charity shops can you um ask friends and family if they want it um quite a few i noticed quite a few households during lockdown had you know um just sort of boxes or tables outside there um, at the end of their drive saying, you know, free, please help yourself and people can have a rummage around in there. Um, check out if you've got a local free cycle or free girl community. Um, I guarantee you probably will. I'm in a tiny, small little market town and we've got one. So look, if you've got um, a free girl community near you, they're um, brilliant communities whereby you sign up and you can post on there anything that you've got. So I always say they're really great for things like if you've opened, you know, a big sack of dog food and the dog's decided after a bowl it doesn't like it anymore, you could probably find someone who will take that off your hands. If you've opened a tin of paint and realised it's the wrong colour, um, you will probably find somebody on there. And you can also post wanteds on there as well. So if you've, um, you know, if you're looking for... Um, I don't know, like boys wellies in a size eight, um, you can spend, um, you know, three weeks searching the charity shops or you can ask on there and people, um, you will be amazed what the generosity that your local community will have. Um, there's also a platform called Olio, O-L-I-O, -O, um, which originally started off as a food sharing platform um, for, to, to share food, unwanted food with your community. And also you can now share kind of anything you like on there. Um, so do check that out as well. So those are nice, easy ways um, for you to pass on the things that you don't want and to ensure that they stay in use. Um, because as I said, when we're, when we're giving stuff, especially clothes to the charity shops, you know, I think they are so overwhelmed and so inundated with it. Um, and, um, you know, it gets put in the rag bags. The rag bags form this billion dollar trade in um, textiles that crosses the globe. And it's ending up in developing um, countries where, where they don't want it now either. They are, they too are inundated with our cheap, fast fashion. And there are mountains of clothes just sat there rotting. So, you know, once you've done your lockdown clear out, then we need to go back to those lower um, levels of the waste hierarchy and think about how we can refuse, reduce and reuse so that we're not ending up in that scenario again. So that's my little um, soapbox thing about um, rehoming. So absolutely do rehome your stuff, really, you know, do all you can to try and avoid um, landfill. But um, let's let's look at those lower levels of the hierarchy and think how we can kind of avoid that happening again. Now, when we did our year buying nothing new, I, I called it my make do and mend year. 
and I'd never really mended anything. Um, I, I learned to sew after our eldest was born, having never been um, particularly artsy or thought I was particularly arty or crafty. Um, but if, if something needed repairing, even a button, I would just have this stash of clothes that I would save up and just sort of give to my mother-in-law to, to sort out when she came around to visit. So, um, but actually repairing is, um, and, and during that year, I was like, okay, I've called it my mate doing mend year, need to, need to actually embrace this and mend. And I sewed on buttons and I very inexpertly patched lots of pairs of jeans. And um, we're very gender stereotyped in our house. And I tend to do the textiles and my husband does the, the white goods and the electricals, but he fixed the washing machine. He's fixed the dishwasher. He's fixed the toaster. All these things that I think we're, we're told aren't made to be fixed anymore. And because relatively um, consumer goods are so much cheaper than they were, sometimes it just feels easier, quicker um, to, to just ditch it. But obviously there's all that, remember there's all that embedded carbon, there's all those embedded resources in these things that, that we're throwing away and they can still, our washing machine um, was mended with some two quid brushes they didn't look like brushes to me, but they were called brushes from eBay after a bit of YouTubing on the behalf of my husband. So, you know, these things can often be quite easily repaired. So do have a go. YouTube is your friend. Um, the best thing about repairing and broken things is they're already broken. You can't make it much worse. Um, and pre-COVID and hopefully um, very soon, um, starting up again, there are these amazing things called repair cafes. So if you go on the repair cafe website, which is repaircafe.org, and um, you should be able to find a repair cafe local to you, which are uh, pop up events, volunteer led and run. Um, and there will be a team of volunteer fixers on hands to help you either to help you or to fix your things for you. So they are absolutely phenomenal. And I think, you know, they have, um, it's a project that started in the Netherlands and has just taken off kind of catastrophic, catastrophically. Hugely, not catastrophically, that's bad. Um, the really interesting thing to note, I think, about recycle on that hierarchy is it's almost a last resort. It's the, it's the penultimate thing on that hierarchy there. So, you know, we were told for a long time that if we were doing our recycling, we were kind of bona fide eco heroes. And, and actually, we're now discovering that um, you know, recycling is good and I'm in no way saying don't recycle, absolutely recycle, check with your, you know, double check on your local council website what you can do curbside, double check what you can take to your recycling centre, have a look on TerraCycle to see what schemes they've got there, but do remember those other parts of the waste hierarchy, so when we're looking at reuse, um, you know, have you got your reusable coffee cup have you got your reusable water bottle have you got your um you know if your kids like straws can you get some reusable straws think about reuse all the time and remember that reusable things are only any good if you actually remember to take them with you and reuse them so recycling is great but it isn't a silver bullet it isn't an innocuous process it involves a lot of energy and very often things are um our perception is that things will be recycled so um you know a, a plastic bottle will be um melted down and made into another plastic bottle and although that technology is is kind of coming online now much more a lot of times plastic is um especially plastic is downcycled and made into things like park benches or fleeces and we're discovering that actually you know um uh fleeces and things like that made from plastics shed microplastics and that in its own is its own problem um so yeah i think the message there is don't not recycle um but have a look at that lower end of the hierarchy to see what you can do first and then the last the top bit is rot so um you know conventionally that would mean landfill or maybe your council does um energy from waste um but don't forget that we can um, compost at home we can have um, if you haven't got space for a compost heap um, you can have a little wormery you can even have a little wormery indoors and that's great for for food waste for um, you know shredded paper for cardboard anything like that so we can rot and it just means that you're getting this lovely you are genuinely then getting this lovely breakdown and this sort of composty mulch um, that benefits the soil and the environment hugely that was my very quick whistle stop tour <laughs> <laughs> um, if you've got any questions, pop them into the Q&A. If you want um, to come and find out more, then there's the website and all my social details and the book. And um, yeah, uh, you know, if you want me to sort of do a slower version of the waste hierarchy, um, then do get in touch. And, and I think I've got blog posts and a podcast and things like that as well. But hopefully that was useful and some takeaways that you can um, take away to use at home or in the office. Amazing. Thank you so much, Jen. Um, that was 
really, really interesting and really, really helpful. Okay, lovely. So uh, that brings us to our next segment uh, hosted by Hugo Tagholm from Surfers Against Sewage. He's gonna talk to us about driving systems change through grassroots activism. Now, Hugo is Chief Executive of Surfers Against Sewage, as I mentioned, which is a national marine conservation campaigning charity. The charity takes action on plastic pollution from the beachfront to the boardroom, working with hundreds of thousands of volunteers and ocean act activists nationwide. It uses evidence found along the coastline and rivers to drive change in the systems, products, and attitudes towards waste. The charity takes actions from the beachfront to the front benches of parliament as well, where it unites the voice for the ocean through its ocean conservation all, par all party parliamentary group, mobilizing over 100,000 community beach and river clean volunteers annually. And it's been instrumental in helping introduce and enforce new government legislation to protect our seas. I'm just handing over control now to you, Hugo. Thank you very much, uh, um, and good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to, uh, to be here to talk to you today. And thanks very much to Investors in the Environment for inviting me here. Um, and thanks to Jen for giving a, a great talk there. Um, I'm Hugo. Um, I'm the Chief Executive of Surface Against Sewage. As I said, um, and we're a national organization based um, down here um, in Cornwall. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today about our campaigns. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit first about the history and the frame of, of our organization. Um, we sometimes uh, need a bit of explaining because of our somewhat esoteric um, title, um, which dates right back um, to 1990, some 30 years ago when we were set up. Um, so um, we're a national reconservation and campaigning charity, um, active right around the country from the tip of Scotland right down to Land's End. Um, we, we are surfer led, I am for my sins uh, a surfer myself and many of our volunteers, um, many of my team here at our headquarters are surfers or, or water enthusiasts. Um, and this year is our 30th anniversary and um, we were established back in May 1990 because of the chronic sewage pollution issue that um, was apparent right around the coastline of um, the UK. Um, we do campaign from the beachfront right through to the front bench of parliament. Um, all of our um, work is really based in the experiences that our members, that the public are having um, on beaches, um, not just in Cornwall, but in every part of this country and to an extent right around the world. We're very proud that this year we announced His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales as our first ever patron, a former surfer and windsurfer himself. Uh, we represent about 400,000 people around the country and we amplify their voice and connect their voice in the Ocean Conservation All Party Parliamentary Group. And the sort of campaigns we run have an impact not just domestically here on the, the waste agenda, but around the world um, at conferences like Our Ocean and the UN Oceans Conference and various other um, sort of um, established processes to uh, tackle the biggest environmental issues that we have on planet Ocean. Um, we've been described over the last 30 years as Britain's coolest pressure group, um, as some of the government's most sophisticated environmental critics, and as an organisation that gets results both on the ground and in the corridors of power. And we pride ourselves at, at being able to have one foot in both camps, one foot firmly with our grassroots activists um, at beaches everywhere, and the other foot in the corridors of power and um, around the table um, with, uh, with corporate um, leaders who are creating change with us. Um, I wanted to start really by talking to you a little bit about the heritage of the organization. Um, we were founded back in the 1990s, which was a, a great decade of, of sort of people um, rising up and a great decade of environmental legislation. And this is an image of, of people protesting against the uh, very unfair poll tax. Um, it was a decade when we saw sweeping environmental legislation coming in from Europe. Um, 
and also a decade that people were taking a stand for the environment. So we saw people chaining themselves to trees to stop bypasses being built. Um, we saw people really taking on the mantle of, of, of trying to challenge the establishment to, uh, to protect the environment and to protect people in our communities. And Surface Against Sewage was very much part of that. It was founded um, down here in the badlands of Cornwall, where we're still based today in St Agnes. Um, and it was, it was started by surfers who were literally sick of getting sick of going into the ocean. Um, raw sewage was pumped out. That was how sewage um, was um, disposed of back in the 80s and very early 90s. That was considered treatment. And that sewage pollution was putting surfers, swimmers, holiday makers, um, and other bathers at risk when they went into the water at our beaches. And so my predecessor started this organization and started the great campaign actions that are memorable to this day. Gas masks, wetsuits, um, turds, and uh, surfboards um, on the streets of London, Manchester, Newcastle, and on the beaches around the country. And that led to some great change. Um, we saw, thanks to my predecessors, a great improvement in water quality over the past um, 30 years. We've gone from what would have been about 40% of our beaches passing the minimum standards to now what is over 90% of our beaches passing those minimum standards. So um, very good campaigning, um, very good legislation, and a very good um, implementation of new investment from the water companies to tackle some of that, um, that issue. Um, that issue is now re-emerging, so there's a big, big new problem with, with sewage pollution um, because some of that investment is already outdated, but that's uh, the continuous improvements we'd always be calling for. And some of that tone that we saw from the 1990s is now coming back with uh, groups like um, the climate groups, um, of course, Fridays for the Future, Greta Thunberg, Extinction Rebellion, starting to mobilize again, bring people together again to challenge the establishment, to challenge not just government, but businesses who are not running um, themselves in a sustainable way, businesses that aren't doing right for people and planet. So we're seeing a whole movement, particularly of young people coming back together to say that they wanna see change, not change, in the future when they get into their careers, but change now. They want to see change from leaders of our businesses and our governments now to make sure that we uh, create a more sustainable future and a sustainable approach right now. Um, we've been, um, of course, evolving over the years. We started on sewage pollution back in 1990. I took over at SAS in 2008 um, to, to rejuvenate the organization and take it in a new direction. And we took on new issues and expanded um, our work across a multitude of environmental um, concerns, plastic pollution being one of the predominant now work on. And back in 2008, we started to really ramp up what we were doing to mobilize communities, to innovate campaigns, and to communicate with the public. Um, in that year, we actually published this image, um, an image um, that actually I got quite a lot of criticism for at the time. People said, but there'll never be that much plastic in the ocean. That's a, a completely impossible scenario. And sure, this is a this is a this is a fake picture, but ultimately it communicates very strongly and it communicates what is a really, really accurate picture of plastic pollution, not just on our beaches in the UK, but in, in the ocean around the world, the sheer volume of plastic that is making our work its way into the environment. And how have we as an organization responded to that pollution, to that waste? Well, of course, we've worked on beach cleans for many years now. Um, since even just before 2008, we were mobilizing people, a few hundred people at the beach clean back then. And this has grown into an army of people around the country, 100,000 people taking action to pick up plastic, to remove it from the beach and do the right thing with it, to put it into the right waste streams, and to start to collect that evidence, to challenge business, to connect with government processes, to say, look, enough is enough. We need to see change and we need to see it now. We've got a plastic pollution crisis and it's already too big. So action is needed immediately. And there have been a couple of tipping points in the journey of the public over the last decade. And one of those was with Storm Hercules back in 2014. 
Now, this is a pressure chart, um, an animation of the, the weather system that, that was Storm Hercules. Um, you can see the darker colors being the, 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 the strength of winds that were generated at that time, the black winds being, being huge, um, hugely powerful winds that drove a lot of plastic pollution on shore. Drove big waves on shore too. This is a picture of Senn Cove, not far from our office, with waves from Storm Hercules crashing ashore, not far from the village. And it drove plastic pollution onto our beaches. Now, this is Perrinport Beach, one of my favorite beaches, a beach where I spend a lot of time with my family, um, where I surf a lot, where I've seen a lot of wildlife, dolphins, seals, basking sharks, um, of course, lots of seabirds. And it's also a beach that is chronically affected by plastic pollution. And this was the scene the morning after Storm Hercules, um, a tide line filled with single-use plastics, disposable plastics, throwaway plastics, however we want to describe them. Um, and this date was logged firmly in the minds of activists. This is when we saw a new uprising um, of people who wanted to not only join us at Beach Cleans, but start new organizations challenge businesses to do more and start a whole new journey of campaigning. There was another big sort of moment um, in the, the journey on public consciousness um, for plastic pollution in the UK and around the world. And that was the Blue Planet um, series screened in 2017, another tipping point in public consciousness. Um, and I had the good fortune of talking alongside James Honeybourne, the producer of Blue Planet um, a, a couple of years ago. Um, and, and, and one of the things out of his amazing talk, a talk where he talked about, he described the creatures that he had seen, the new behaviors that he had seen and documented through the series. But what stuck with me most about his talk that out of seven hours of broadcasting, just 14 minutes was dedicated to plastic pollution. 14 minutes that changed how we responded to it, 14 minutes that changed how government started to respond to plastic pollution in 14 minutes that, that mobilized a whole new sense of public engagement and momentum in tackling the crisis that we're seeing in our ocean. And that's one that we have a crisis. Um, the plastic production statistics are shocking. Um, between 2000 and 2010, more plastic was produced than in all of time before that. And we know that plastic production figures are set to quadruple over the coming decades. So if we've got a plastic pollution crisis now, no, it's, it's no doubt that we will have one in the coming decades if we don't take radical action now and radically reform how we're um, managing waste, how we're managing that resource back into our economy. Of course, we see terrible scenes like this, this sperm whale washed up, its stomach filled with plastic pollution, almost a daily occurrence that makes headline news and, uh, and social media channels um, around our ecosystem. We do know we can't pick our way out of the problem. Um, it would be impossible and it's, it's not a solution just to run beach cleans to respond to the ever growing amount of single use and other plastics our environment because it's big business that drives the, the production of these new plastics um, pointless plastics um, plastics that should be replaced plastics that should have a better end of life solution to them plastics that should correspond to a system that is creating domestic recycling and creating a closed loop circular economy here in the uk we uh, run a regular brand audit as part of our beach cleans and um, and a quarter of the plastic pollution we found last year um, was produced by just five multinational companies. Five companies that are making huge profits at the expense of the planet without the right systems in place to contain and control the plastic they're producing. This um, film I'm about to show you, you might want to turn down your volume, it's quite loud, was a, was a call to arms that we had issued just before um, before the, the screening of the, the Blue Planet 2 back in 2017, we issued this in the springtime of 2017. Um, and this um, is, a, is a film that, that was actually challenging the status quo. It's called Wasteland. We live in a dangerous time. A new superpower is rising in the Pacific. 
A country five times larger than North Korea is amassing the greatest chemical threat ever known. Yet its aggressive expansion is being ignored. Governments refuse sanctions, and leading corporations continue to profit from it. The battle for the Pacific has already been lost. But this is just the start. Expanding its borders with the plastics we throw away, it threatens the entire planet. This is wasteland. Now that film, of course, another huge dramatization um, was trying to shift the responsibility away from um, beach cleaners and individuals um, back into the corporations that are profiting from um, creating so much single use um, and avoidable plastics. It was also the launch of a new program we had um, called Plastic Free Communities and Plastic Free Coastlines, which was moving beyond the beach clean, uh, a new five-step program inspired by the Fair Trade Towns um, um, initiative that empowered people at a local level to connect businesses, local government, um, local NGOs, schools, and other stakeholders to reduce their collective plastic footprint and challenge businesses to do the same, not just at a, a, a regional level, but at a national and international level. And I'm very proud that we've got now over 700 communities representing millions of people around the UK participating in the Plastic Free Communities Programme. Um, and it's really important that all of this community movement connects with, um, with, with government um, and we create a level playing field or level ocean for businesses to work with. Um, we have our communities that are beach cleaning, um, about 100,000 people a year. We've got millions of people that come together with our Plastic Free Communities Initiative. Um, we have about a million school children in um, our Plastic Free Schools program. And all of that connects together into a really powerful voice that we can use to have a very positive conversation with government and business about the changes that we want to see. And we started an all-party parliamentary group, um, or we helped start an all-party par all parliamentary group back in 2014. Um, it's now called the Ocean Conservation APPG. This was the moment that we sort of got that off the ground um, at 10 Downing Street uh, back then. Uh, we delivered a petition with Ben Howard, the musician, um, to, uh, to Downing Street, which was a, a big moment for us and has helped us unite the voices of various charities and organizations um, with politicians to seek changes that we want to see. And what are those changes? Well, I'm very proud that we worked on the plastic bag charge, which has uh, already eliminated billions of plastic bags from circulation, a win um, for communities and a win for the environment. We uh, were one of the leading and are one of the leading proponents for an all-in deposit return system that can stop the millions and millions of plastic bottles that end up uh, in our environment, in our parks, on our streets, um, in our um, rivers and in our ocean. Um, a deposit return system is a, a proven way to create a much more circular economy, a way of putting a small incentive, um, a small charge, as some of you will know, um, on a beverage container, um, and that will incentivize uh, people, consumers, to do the right thing, to take that back to uh, reverse vending machines and other points where they can uh, give those back um, to get their deposit back. That creates a, a domestic recycling economy. It delivers very pure recycling and um, pro is proven to, um, from examples around the world, to elevate recycling levels to um, above 95% typically. So uh, a success for the environment, a success for the economy and a success for people. Um, we've, uh, we, to, to, to get that, that, uh, that, that commitment for government to the deposit return system, we, we did a, a whole range of campaigns. We had 330,000 people support a, a petition. Um, we took a, a, a battleship around the country made out of plastic bottles our beach cleaners had, um, had, uh, had found on beaches. And we had many, many meetings with the Environmental Audit Committee, with um, government in 10 Downing Street. So we, again, took our campaigns right from the beachfront right through to the corridors of power to create that change. Um, and this, um, this last 
couple of weeks alone, we've seen the introduction of the ban on straw stairs and cotton bud sticks. Another campaign, our volunteers, our regional reps and our members helped support. They collected evidence at the beachfront to, uh, to, uh, to get that um, through Parliament. Um, and that will stop billions of pieces of plastic ending up um, in our ocean. So a big win for our ocean. And at the moment, we're seeing a pandemic, of course, and new types of plastic pollution emerging. Um, this new video here, if it will start. There's a small video that I took just the other day when I was co-steering with my son, um, PPE plastic pollution, which is a, a new type of single-use waste that we're seeing at most of our beaches now. So again, connecting back to Jen's talk, this just shows the need to have a much more reuse and uh, re uh, recycle economy. So we've really got to think about reusables in this context. Um, so we're in this new decade, a decade um, of the ocean, the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, a UN Decade of Habitat and Ecosystem Restoration. So it's crucial that we take action to stop the inputs of not just plastic, but sewage waste and other pollutants that are, that are impacting the habitats that we love, the habitats and, um, and spaces that we use for recreation, but also the ecosystems that we might not know a lot about already. And I wanted to show you another film um, to sort of end the presentation um, called The Creature, which is touching on exactly that. So. I think it, I, you know, I think it's, it was, I've never seen anything that looks like this. It looked like a whale, but it, I don't know if it was a whale. I don't know. Like a big lump of, like a, initially like a, a seal, huge seal. Amazing. Very strange. It was hard to know whether it was alive at first. But then there was, there was a slight wheezing. I mean, it was amazing how everybody pulled together so quickly and did the best that they could. Reaching in and pulling out so much stuff. We're just trying to get her to breathe again. The kids were, were incredible. They had just like this natural instinct to care for things. It sounds bonkers, but there was... It was kind of like a flashing. Pulsating. It was definitely responding to us in some way. We thought it meant, we thought we'd saved her, but it was. When his energy kind of went. I think we all knew. Once the tide came up, we just, we let it go. And it just felt right to, to give it back to the sea. So I wanted to leave you with a, a couple of thoughts. Um, 
Um, I've just finished reading a, a, a Hemingway book, um, and there was one quote from it that really, really stuck with me that I think is very relevant to the discussion that you're having and to this um, this uh, this day. Um, and that's how did you go bankrupt? Two ways, gradually and suddenly. And this is effectively what we're doing to our environment. I think with waste, we're, we're with plastic pollution in particular, we're filling up our environment, and we are doing this. Um, uh, without the recognition that there will be a, a cliff edge at some stage. So uh, a really important quote. And I think we all have to ask ourselves if we're doing enough to shift the, the dial for planet ocean. There's always more that we can do. And business as usual is killing our planet. So we do need radical reform and radical change over this next decade. Thank you very much. Amazing. Thank you so much, Hugo. That's... Um really a um, few moving videos in particular and it really drives home the need for continued action and motivates us I think to beat back complacency on um, plastics pollution especially during this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure I'm trying to... Oh. Right so um, moving on to our Q&A session we've had some interesting comments um, and nice, nice questions as well here. Um, so let's start with, is, is the pace of change to tackle waste sufficient to tackle the plastic pollution crisis? That's probably a question for, for both, but maybe starting with Hugo. Yeah, look, I, um, you know, I think it's, uh, uh, this is a question I get a lot. And, uh, and, and I think it's, it's proven, uh, you know, so far to be insufficient. Um, there is more single use plastic waste um, than ever before. Um, our systems aren't keeping pace with the production. You know, the systems can control that plastic um, are, not, are not keeping pace with the production. And Jen used the term earlier, out of sight, sort of out of mind. Now we may live in a country um, that seemingly has good waste management systems but but that is is of course landfilling a lot of stuff or exporting it to other countries that can't deal with it and we often have the the sort of audacity to point our fingers at those developing countries and say it's it's their problem you know the the, the bottom line is we do need to reduce the amount of plastic we're producing and we need to create systems that truly are circular. So we need a, a materials and a systems revolution to, uh, to do this. And there is a lot of corporate responsibility that we need as part of that, because, um, because at the moment, uh, the, the, the damage or the cost of, of, of our waste is externalized to, to ruining our, our environment effectively, sadly. I don't, I don't think I can say anything more articulate <laughs> or eloquent than that. <laughs> But well, we do have a, a question um, probably aimed towards you, Jen, actually is, so in light of, you know, the, the scale of the issue, um, how do we, how do you cope with knowing that you are a small cog in the whole waste system? How do we change big business for the better? Yeah, and I, I don't know if anybody's had a chance to watch um, David Attenborough's new Netflix, um, Is It A Life On Our Planet? I watched it at the weekend at, and at the end of it felt very small. I felt very um, inconsequential and, you know, how on earth can I possibly make a difference? But I consistently come back to this point that, you know, as individuals and as a family, we can only do so much, but we, we can do that much. Do you know, like we can, that we underestimate as consumers, I think the power of our choices. So we, you know, we make choices every single day um, largely unconsciously about what we buy, about who we're giving our money to. Um, and, you know, if, if we have um, the capacity to make different choices in terms of our budget and things like that, then, then I feel like we have a responsibility to do that. But I think the other thing we underestimate as individuals and as families is, is the power of our voices. And, um, you know, Hugo was saying um, those sort of top five polluting companies. Well, we can take to social media and tell them that that's not good enough. We can, you know, not only can we not buy their products and, and um, look for reusable options, but we can also very actively, very, very loudly, if we want to tell them that, that that's not good enough and that we want to give our money to other people. So, and the whole, uh, you know, was it um, this week or last week, the ban came in on um, 
plastic straws and things that's all come bottom up that's all come from consumer power from this reaction to blue planet 2 from amazing campaigns like surfers against sewage so please don't ever feel like you're too small a cog and and you know i think that the more conversations we can have you know, I, I struggle a little bit to have conversations with friends and family around this stuff because I feel like they're like, oh, she's off again and like rolling their eyes at me. But these are important conversations to have and we can do it in a very gentle, very non-judgmental way. And we can also model those behaviours for, for our friends and family and for our kids. So we can make it really normal to use reusables. We can ask our local coffee shop if they can watch the contactless coffee uh, video from... Um, from city to sea you know and if they can think about using reusables again we we have a huge amount of power um but i also think that we need to use that power to put pressure on the the businesses and the corporations who have even more power amazing yes um lots of questions and comments around getting involved um but we are short of time so if if anybody who has submitted a question if we're not able to answer it we will post some links on our website um, within the next week to follow through both on um, sort of general activism and, and getting involved as well as some personal choices um, with some of the resources that both Jen and Hugo with Surface Against Sewage have. But one last question um, aimed particularly at, at Hugo, how can people get involved with SAS plastic pollution campaigns, especially those of us who are not lucky enough to live near the coast? Uh, yeah, look, it's a really good question. And just to, to, to Jen, sort of, um, sort of point, just to, to follow on, I think that the, 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 everyone's individual actions do count. It's really important. But the, the, the important thing is that they connect up and we, we create change. Lots of social change and legislative change comes when there's unrest amongst people. And they, they, they all feel the same and they push at politicians to, to, to drive the, the frameworks within which businesses operate. So that's, that's really important. So never feel feel sort of disempowered at any step. And that's what our job as an organization is to help people feel empowered and to shine a light on them. In terms of our name, in terms of being near the coast, uh, we're, we're not um, exclusive or excluding. So about 30% of our plastic free communities are on the coastline, 30% are rural and 30% are urban. It's a really even sort of split. And they're all over the country from Hackney and Camden Town um, uh, through to sort of Sennan and, and poor, poor Town down here in Cornwall. So there's, there's lots of different um, opportunities and the toolkit is designed um, not as a coastal toolkit, but as a, as, a, as a toolkit for anyone. So just come onto our website and you'll be able to find all of those resources in the step-by-step -step guide and get involved with the campaigns. You can come to a beach clean or a river clean, wherever you are, um, and you can, um, you can join us at uh, Campaign Actions. You can sign petitions. You can contact your MP. So lots of things you can do with SAS. We're an inclusive organisation, uh, an inclusive organisation geography as well. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you both to you, Hugo, and to Jen. And as I said, we're going to post some uh, resources and links uh, to various things that you've touched on during this talk um, on our website in the next few days. Uh, now it's time to announce uh, the winner of IIE's Best Waste Production 2020. So a business that is putting um, a lot of action in place with regard to really reducing reducing waste. So this year, as I mentioned, we're marking a decade of the IIE awards. So in addition to bronze, silver, and green accreditation, we're also awarding IIE member organizations for going above and beyond in eight special categories and best waste reduction is one of those. Um, the results will be announced throughout the week for the other categories, as well as the awards itself on Thursday. So now I'm ready to announce and celebrate as well the winner of our best waste reduction category for 2020. So what we were looking for was the best waste reduction overall, innovative or impactful action on plastics reduction, reuse and recycling, and use of circular economy principles. And the winner is Northampton General Hospital. Judges liked that Northampton General Hospital succeeded in removing most plastic cutlery and plastic straws. They also installed water fountains and introduced reusable crockery, resulting in 220,000 fewer plastic cups. So um, this is all, you know, an NHS trust incredibly um, during this time of, of um, you know, COVID and, and need for PPE. But their use of reusable scrub, scrub hats, uh, over 2,000 named hats and pioneering uh, one of being one of the first trusts to do 
uh, use reusable theater gowns has also saved one ton of clinical waste per month. All of these actions saving significant money for the trust, improving patient safety and experience, and having remarkable environmental co-benefits. Also noteworthy was their huge staff engagement campaign, Small Action, Big Impact, which got staff to make over 800 pledges to change their own behaviors. Um, additional co commendation uh, goes to Perkins Engines, who was uh, commended for a huge boost in recycling rate, reduction in uh, process waste and manufacturing, as well as significant engagement efforts, particularly in the staff canteen uh, around dec decreasing disposables and improving um, food waste results and terra cycling. So thank you everybody um, for attending this talk. Uh, special thank you to Hugo and Jen for your very inspiring and engaging words. Uh, we really appreciate it. I think we're all looking for uh, you know, actions that we can take personally as well as within our organizations. And I know so many of our businesses are always looking at what can they do next and getting that motivation is, is one of the first steps in taking action. So thank you. Uh, our category sponsor, thank you very much for uh, Cool Food. And our other IIE award sponsors for 2020, uh, BGL Group, Ecotricity, Davies Veterinary Specialists, Green Energy Switch, Roy Thorne Solicitors, Cross Keys Homes, and Hunt and Coombs Solicitors. So thank you again to everyone and stay tuned for the rest of our talks this week. This afternoon from four o'clock, we're giving, um, we've got a talk given by Sustrans on sustainable transport and uh, advocacy in improving uh, sustainable transport in your local area. Thank you very much and everybody have a great day.